this week in my random wanderings through the internet, I have become aware of a crisis in the luxury watch market. You, you know, I, I suspect that most of us probably have a you know, $25 plastic watch that we wear around for most purposes, but you probably know that there are companies mainly in Switzerland and Germany that produce watches that have five and six digit price tags. And there are those who are enthusiasts in this field who buy many of these apparently, uh, but who aren't simply buying them in order to be able to look at their wrist and tell what time it is, but they're buying them because there's a certain degree of speculation in it. Some of these watches are produced in only very small quantities, and there are legendary old ones that you can't get anymore. And so apparently there has always been a pretty lively secondary market where people who have these things will sell them, you know, the, the, the eBay for things that cost $100,000. That was all very well, and it kind of cooked along as it did until COVID happened. And then these watch companies, as much as everybody else, had a hard time getting the materials they needed to produce what it was they made. And so for a while, for two or three years in recent times, there were fewer luxury watches available in the stores where you would normally go to get them. And this had the net effect of jacking the prices up in the secondary market. People were paying five and six and seven times the sticker price for these things in order to get them. They became very desirable. Now, of course, the watch companies noticed this. And when they began to get materials again, they began to produce more watches. At which point, the bottom kind of dropped out of this, this price structure. And suddenly, people who had paid an enormous amount of money for this little object no longer had much other than something to wear on their wrist and tell what time it was. It's worth knowing, dear friends, what they were doing with these things in the first place, whether in fact they wanted them to tell the time or if in fact they were buying something that was a way of storing wealth and saying to other people, look how much of it I have. There are some signs that it was really the latter, because if you watch any of the videos on YouTube about this topic, you'll see shots of, of the interiors of people's houses where they have elaborate box con contraptions to store their watches. Some even have mechanisms that'll keep the watch moving so that it stays wound all the time. Plainly, these things were not simply intended for what they were made for, but rather for something much different. Now, as I say, most of us probably have a, a Timex that costs 100 bucks on our wrist, but if we see this happening elsewhere, we probably should be looking for it in ourselves as well, asking what our stuff is for. Where are we looking? Where is our attention? Are we, in fact, looking at what time it is, or are we, in fact, looking to see whether other people are looking to see what's on our wrist? And again, it's easy to imagine this happening with those who are, for reasons that, that pass understanding, $1,000 for a watch. But it's true also of the kind of stuff that we think of as being more humble and more ordinary in our own lives. Our houses, our cars, our money. Not just that, but things that we take for granted, things we don't even really think of as being things that we have, and yet they are our lives, our health our creativity, our energy, everything that we have, everything that we have been given that we carry around in the world with us. <clears throat> Does all that stuff serve us? Or are we serving it? Before we get too deeply into that, I want to tell you about two other things that I found this week and see where the, perhaps that gets us a little further in thinking about this. The first is, I, I was aware of a painting by Norman Rockwell called Freedom from Want. Now, it's telling in my psychology that when I went looking for it, I remembered it being called Freedom from Worry. And that will tell you something about my relationship with stuff, perhaps. But there is this painting called Freedom from Want. You may or may not know it. it, it he painted it in the, the mid-1940s during World War II. It was one of a set of four of the, the they were called. This particular one shows this large and sort of impossibly wholesome family sitting down to Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, Grandma is just bringing out this enormous turkey to set on the table. And what struck me was that these paintings had been made into posters during World War II, and the tagline on all these posters was, ours to fight for. 
it made me stop and wonder, well, what is all this fighting for? What exactly are we fighting for in this picture? Now, plainly, because it was done during World War II and it was intended for a variety of other purposes, there's a lot of emotional stuff going on in this picture about a way of life and family and feeling safe and, and all these other things that were intended to encourage someone to, to fight for his country or her country in, in that time. But it's certainly speaking to us as well. Certainly, if we are honest with ourselves, of all the American holidays, Thanksgiving is the one where there is the blurriest line between enough and too much. So it's worth asking, what exactly are we fighting for when it comes to stuff? Does our stuff make us fight? Who is it that we're fighting to keep the stuff, to get the stuff? Are we really imagining that somehow in order for us to have enough stuff, somebody else has to have too little? Is that really the way of the kingdom of God? That's one thing to think about. Hold on to that thought for a minute. The other is from my bank. I do most of my ordinary routine banking with Bank of America. And so every time I go to my phone and open the Bank of America app, there is their advertising slogan. Anybody else work with Bank of America? You know what their slogan is? What would you like to have the power to do? And that got me thinking as well about what exactly this power is. What they would like you to be picturing when they say this is things like having the power to send your child to college so he or she can achieve his or her full potential and eventually become a medical researcher and find the cure for cancer. Wouldn't you like to have the power to buy a house in which you make a home? being very clear that you buy the one, not the other. Wouldn't you like to have the power to take your spouse back to the old country, to reconnect with those distant cousins who have always been there but whom he or she has never had the chance to meet? There are all these things that are, are worthwhile in our lives, but don't mistake the fact that Bank of America deals in stuff. It deals in money, the detached form of stuff. So when we're talking about power, it's worth asking, <clears throat> what is this power? Does our stuff give us power? Does our stuff have power? Does this stuff have power over us? And in any case, why or how should we imagine our stuff having any power? Now, those two things taken together, I think, are of thinking of the backstory of what's going on in the gospel this morning with this man who comes running up to Jesus. It really is kind of a cameo thing. Jesus is going off to do something else and completely by accident somebody runs up and asks him this question and then runs away and we never hear, hear of him again. We have no idea what he did with the information that he got from Jesus. Now we could think for a minute that Jesus was just answering off the cuff because he was caught unawares. He wasn't really thinking in those terms but I want to suggest to you that Jesus is one of those people who is pretty much always on. He always says what he intends. He always means it. And so I think it's worth taking this encounter seriously, taking all that, what I've just said for the past few minutes about stuff, into account and know that that was probably in that man's head and it was probably in Jesus' head. It was in the head of all the other people who were listening to what Jesus had to say. As an aside, it would make an edifying Sunday morning activity for all of us to reimagine how this man says what he says. When I read it out of, out of the book, I did it in church voice. A good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what if, in fact, what he said was, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Or in a slightly different translation, good teacher, what? do I have to do to inherit eternal life? We don't really know exactly what he was asking or how he was asking it. Maybe a hint that Jesus seems a little irritated that he calls him good teacher, but nonetheless, we get the answer that we get. 
And down through the centuries, there have been those who said, well, we have to take this literally. There are, there's a clear indication here coming from the co-eternal Son of God that what we must do is be poor in order to be pious. And that is probably true for some of us. There are probably some people whose true calling is to poverty as a way of living out their faith. But I'm sure you know, because you were all once, as I was, a teenager in confirmation class, how easy it is to shoot this down by saying, well, okay, you give away everything you have, you make yourself poor, and now you're part of the problem. So I don't know whether taking it literally is necessarily the best answer here. But if it isn't meant to be literal, what to say? What are we supposed to take away from this? I think there's a hint, a clue about where we're supposed to go with this in what Jesus says with his followers later when they're asking him what all of this means. Peter says to him, we gave away everything. We walked away from everything to be here with you. We've sacrificed everything for the sake of following you that Jesus doesn't come back with, well, anybody who gives away everything will inherit eternal life. He comes back with very specific things that he lists. And he doesn't say those who walk away from their five-car from their powerboat and from their 401k and follow me will inherit eternal life. What he says is those who leave houses and mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and fields will inherit eternal life and will gain all of those things back with persecutions. First, the, the first part of it, those things, I mean, plainly, houses and fields are things. They are things that serve a deeper purpose for most of us and have through most of human history. A house is, again, as I said earlier, where you make a home. It's where you are able to show hospitality to other people where you can be safe, where you can give safety to other people, shelter. And fields, at least for most of human history, have been where we and other people we care about produce enough food to feed ourselves. Again, a very basic sort of thing. And everything else that he mentions is about relationships, not about stuff. I think what we are being told is that somehow we have to look at all that stuff and value it only to the extent that it enables us to form and maintain and nourish relationships. Does our stuff build a wall around us? Is our stuff a fortress that we hide inside of? Certainly, we know people who have done that. Their goal was to be as rich as possible so that they would be safe from the world. And if they were truly honest with themselves, probably they would be safe from the, the, the bigger concerns that we put under the heading of things that are in the hands of God. Is that what we do with our stuff, or do we use it instead to build bridges? Do we use it to build relationships? Do we use it to nourish relationships, <clears throat> I think, is a much and yet much more challenging way to imagine what our stuff, what our possessions, everything we have been given to include ourselves is meant to be for in the eyes of God and in the economy of God. But then there is that last little piece, isn't there? You'll be given multiple multiples of all these things but with persecutions why does he add that i have a feeling it's because there's something about relationships that requires us to enter with vulnerability to choose to be vulnerable to choose to do what the world would not do which is to say keep all that stuff because you never know when you're going to need to defend yourself with it but rather to rely on the relationships with one another and particularly the relationship with God. To be vulnerable, to be vulnerable by choice. To value connections over 
protections. And so to come over time to see the true value of everything that we have. It doesn't mean giving it all away. It doesn't mean being prodigal with it, wasting it. It means using it in a way that produces what is truly valuable and what truly endures. So, dear friends, I challenge you this week, notice where your gaze is. Is it on what time it is? Or is it on what everybody else is thinking? Surely, to build relationships, to be loving with others, with everything that we have and everything that we are, is truly to be followers of Jesus. Amen.